Hello! Come along with me today on a whirlwind tour of the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Now, Jupiter has, as far as we know, 79 moons. Actually, an 80th one was discovered just in 2021 by an amateur astronomer, but it hasn't been made official yet. The smallest of these moons are tiny little rocks with diameters of little more than a kilometer, while the largest is larger, though slightly less massive, than the planet Mercury. The four largest moons of Jupiter are called Europa, Io, Callisto, and Ganymede. And these are the Galilean moons. These moons got their name because they were the ones that were visible when Galileo first turned his telescope on Jupiter over 400 years ago now. Galileo actually called them the Medician stars, named after his former student who is now the Grand Duke of Tuscany, hoping that he might get patronage from the Medici family, showing that if one thing's been constant for the past four centuries, it's that astronomers are always trying to get that funding. <laughs> Interestingly, all of the Galilean moons are bright enough that they would be visible by eye if they weren't located so close to Jupiter, but Jupiter being so bright overwhelms them in the night sky. The Galilean moons of Jupiter were the first objects ever detected to orbit a planet other than Earth, so they were a huge piece of evidence against geocentrism, which was the model that was dominant in that day. All four of these moons are larger than any of the dwarf planets in our solar system, and three of them are larger than our own moon. And like our moon, all of the Galilean moons of Jupiter are in synchronous rotation, which means that they are tidally locked to their planet, and so the same side is always facing Jupiter. You can see with all the moons depicted with their relative sizes, though obviously not the accurate spacing, <laughs> that they are all extremely different. Let's start with Europa, the smallest of the Galilean moons. This moon is named after Europa, who was one of Zeus's lovers in Greek mythology and the mother of King Minos. Europa is also called Jupiter II, being the second closest of the Galilean moons. Compared to our moon, Europa has a radius that's about 90% of the size of our moons, and its mass is about 65% of our moon's mass. You may notice that the surface of Europa has these strange lines. These are called linea, and they're actually cracks in a layer of ice that encases the entire moon. Now, we've talked about icy surfaces on solar system bodies before, usually made of things like nitrogen and methane, but in this case, I just mean good old water ice. With a surface temperature between 50 and 110 Kelvin, this water ice is thick and hard as rock, basically creating the solid surface of the moon. But water on Europa isn't just in the form of this icy crust. Beneath the ice, there's actually a salty, liquid water ocean. This interior water is warmed enough to be liquid thanks to tidal interactions between Jupiter and Europa. Water has also been spotted jetting out of the surface of Europa in enormous plumes that can be up to 100 miles high. Now, just how thick this ice layer is and just how much water is in this liquid ocean is still being modeled and debated by scientists, but there's no doubt that this warm liquid water is one of the prime targets for extraterrestrial life in the solar system. Obviously, this makes Europa a really attractive exploration target, especially because these plumes of water means that it might be possible to sample the subsurface ocean without having to drill through miles of ice. And in fact, NASA has an upcoming mission called Europa Clipper that is going to be exploring Europa through a series of 45 flybys. Europa Clipper will be carrying imagers, mass spectrometers, and radar that can penetrate all that ice, and it's going to be a hugely important mission for investigating non-terrestrial habitability. NASA also has a mission concept for a Europa lander, but while the mission is still being studied, it is not currently funded. And the ESA mission, JUICE, will be making two flybys of Europa, but more about that later. Now, the next largest of the moons is the one that is closest to Jupiter, Jupiter 1, or Io. Now, Io is named for another one of Zeus's lovers. This particular naming scheme was the work of German astronomer Simon Marius. Now, Io's radius is just a few percent larger than the radius of our moon, and it's about 20% more massive. Now, like I mentioned, all of the Galilean moons are tidally locked to Jupiter, but Io, being the closest, it orbits Jupiter in less than 43 hours, is the most strongly affected by these tidal forces. This means that tidal heating provides a significant amount of internal heat on Io, making its surface very geologically active. We've actually seen as many as nine volcanoes erupting at the same time. And being so close to Jupiter, Io also interacts very strongly with Jupiter's magnetic field. In fact, Io is likely the source of the majority of charged particles that are trapped within Jupiter's magnetic field. 
All that volcanism on Io leads to a large variety of materials being deposited all over the surface, giving it this kind of colorful and hodgepodge appearance, including quite a lot of sulfur and sulfur dioxide which give this yellowish hue to Io. That smell pretty bad. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, neither Juice nor Europa Clipper will fly by Io, but both will use their instruments to remotely monitor volcanic activity on the moon. Next up, we have Callisto. Callisto, or Jupiter 4, is the second largest of Jupiter's moons, and it is the furthest of all of the Galilean moons, taking over two weeks to orbit Jupiter. Callisto is named after a nymph from Greek mythology who was, of course, one of Zeus's lovers. <laughs> Callisto's radius is about 40% larger than that of our moon, which means that it's almost 40% of the Earth's own radius. And its mass is about 46% more than that of our moon, making it almost 2% of the Earth's mass. You may notice that this radius is quite a bit larger than that of the moon Io, meaning that Callisto's volume is over twice as much as Io, however Callisto only has a mass that's about 1.2 times that of Io. And in fact, Callisto is much less dense than Io, and this density trend is true for all of the Galilean moons, which get less dense as you get farther out from Jupiter. This low density for Callisto implies that it contains quite a lot of ice, which is much less dense than rock. And scientists estimate that Callisto's mass fraction of ice is about 49 to 55%. One thing that's very noticeable about the surface of Callisto is all of the craters. Now both Io, because of its volcanic activity, and Europa, because of its icy tectonic plates, don't really have many surface craters. However, Callisto is almost saturated with craters. That means every new crater basically erases some of the older craters. This is because Callisto is very old, and it doesn't have any active surface processes that can remove craters once they happen. Now, Callisto might have its own water subsurface ocean, but it's probably quite a bit smaller than that of Europa, and it probably has significant amounts of ammonia in it. Also, because Callisto is so far from Jupiter, it has much less internal heating from tidal forces, making it a much less attractive target for potential extraterrestrial habitability. ESA's JUICE mission will make several flybys of Callisto. Lastly, we have Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede. Also known as Jupiter 3, Ganymede was named after a hero from Greek mythology who was considered to be the most beautiful mortal and for that reason was abducted by Zeus to serve as his cupbearers. Now to my layperson's knowledge, there's varying levels of sexual relationships involved in this, but suffice to say that when Simon Morius came up with this naming scheme, he certainly considered that to be the case. When he chose these names for the Galilean moons, he said, Io, Europa, the boy Ganymede, and Callisto all greatly pleased the lustful Zeus. Its radius is over 40% of the Earth's radius, and its mass is only 40 times less than that of the Earth, making it twice as massive as our own moon. Ganymede, being closer to Jupiter, is slightly denser than Callisto, but it still contains a very significant mass fraction of ice, probably about 46 to 50%. And like Europa, and probably Callisto, Ganymede has a subsurface ocean of liquid water. Scientists think it might even be layers of ocean in between layers of ice. This makes it another promising target in the search for extraterrestrial life in our solar system, although Europa still probably takes the crown among the Galilean moons. Ganymede also has a lot of water ice on its surface, but it's not quite as uniform and homogeneous as Europa's very solid ice shell. On parts of its surface, Ganymede has these grooved structures that are reminiscent of the Linnea on Europa, but scientists still aren't sure what the heating mechanism that might cause these grooves is. One very cool thing about Ganymede is that it has its own magnetic field, independent of interactions with Jupiter's magnetic field. It is the only moon that we know of to have this feature, and this magnetic field creates a little Ganymedean magnetosphere complete with its own radiation belts. Okay, let's talk more about JUICE now. So JUICE is an ESA mission that's called the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer that is scheduled to launch in 2022. After a short eight-ish year trip, <laughs> the spacecraft will arrive in the Jovian system. Now JUICE will fly by Europa and Callisto, but its primary target is Ganymede. JUICE will actually enter orbit around Ganymede, becoming the first spacecraft to orbit a moon besides our own. While in orbit around Ganymede, JUICE will be observing the moon and trying to characterize its subsurface oceans, map its surface, study that really cool magnetic field, and many other things. Definitely pretty excited about this, and this mission has overlap with the Europa Clipper mission, so we are really in for a treat in the upcoming decade and a half as far as Jupiter's moons. 
So I mentioned the decreasing density as you go out from Jupiter, from Io to Europa to Ganymede to Callisto. This is actually evidence for the common formation of these moons. Just like the young sun had a protoplanetary disk of gas and dust out of which the planets formed, a giant planet can have a similar proto-lunar disk out of which moons can form. And in fact, we saw this happening in an exoplanet system for the very first time ever in 2021. Moons that formed in this sort of proto-lunar disk would be expected to be denser closer to the giant planet because there'd be less ice available to build the moons at those locations, just like we see with the Galilean moons. And just like the planets of the solar system, moons that formed in a disk together, we would expect them to orbit in the same direction and in relatively the same plane, which the Galilean moons of Jupiter do. Speaking of orbits, this is one of my favorite things about the Galilean moons, being slightly biased as I am myself a planetary dynamicist. <laughs> the inner three Galilean moons, Io, Europa, and Ganymede, are in a special orbital configuration called a resonance. Europa's orbital period is twice that of Io's, and Callisto's orbital period is twice that of Europa's. And it's not just each moon interacting with one other moon. All three of them are actually in a resonance called a Laplace resonance, which is a four to two to one three body resonance. Now this isn't just an interesting quirk, it actually has significant implications. For one thing, it's more evidence that these moons formed in a protolunar circumjovian disk because interactions with the disk can cause migration that actually places the moons in this type of orbital configuration. For another thing, this resonance allows the moons to have higher eccentricities than they otherwise would, which leads to more tidal heating. This is especially significant for Io and all of those wonderful volcanoes. The resonance also keeps Io's orbit in place and prevents it from being pushed farther out from Jupiter. Now Callisto is too far out to have been part of this resonance chain, which means that it lacked that extra tidal heating, which led to a different evolution and internal structure for that moon. So this was a lot to cover, and each of these moons is really interesting in its own right, but I think that the Galilean moons of Jupiter are most interesting as a family, and so that's why we went to all of them today. I hope you learned something, and I hope you got a little bit more excited about Europa Clipper and Juice with me. I hope you will join us again next time as we travel out to the second largest moon in the solar system, Saturn's Titan. Thanks for watching, have a good one, bye!